Nonprofit Center for College and Career Readiness, and uh, today is a chat and chew uh, brought to you by Meteor Education and all of the Meteor peeps. Uh, if you see on your screen, you see some of those folks, Sebastian Sanchez, who is our producer, and Man Friday today, uh, Ruth Bruss, who makes it all happen, and uh, Linda Gale Walker, who is one of our educational specialists. You see this on the screen, one of my guests today, Josh Newton, and we'll get to Josh in a little bit. Uh, and uh, we hope to have uh, Annette Gurley with us as well. Uh, today's uh, topic is about the difference between homeschooling and uh, when you are in a crisis mode or crisis schooling. And uh, I thought that I would uh, bring up a, uh, uh, screen just here for a moment um, to show you some of the information uh, that came through from an article that actually started us off today. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I hope every, everyone can see it okay. Uh, Sebastian, you can uh, weigh in if they can't see my screen. Uh, this is an article from Edweek, and we'll make sure that everyone gets a copy of the article after today's uh, conversation. But essentially, uh, uh, Natalie Millman uh, talks about the difference between online education and really kind of crisis at home and gives us some things to think about. And so I wanted to start us off, and Josh, I know you have some things directly that you'll talk about here. Um, but uh, Natalie says, you know, when we think about what we need to do in this very unique time, we need to over communicate. And I was thinking about that as a parent as well. I have two kids at home and, um, you know, I, I'm kind of a co-teacher with uh, my kids teacher. We don't get a lot of communication from the teachers. That's not a critique, but we just don't. So if this parent didn't know what to do or how to help their student, that might be a problem. So communicate frequently and also communicate honestly. You know, your student might be struggling or it's okay if, uh, if they're having a meltdown today or whatever, right? Um, also, we should think about prioritizing our needs. I mean, right now, we want to make sure that our kids are safe. We want to make sure that our students, you know, are logging in or showing up. And sometimes that's just simply a check-in. Uh, I was reading some uh, articles about uh, student absenteeism right now, which is really, really high. And certainly it can be better if our students are simply participating, right? Uh, be flexible. I think everyone knows that. Um, but I think that's a really good message to our parents. If you think about some of our parents who are super, super invested in their students' performance, right? How their students are doing and all of those things. Uh, making sure that they know, hey, it's okay. Cut the kids some slack. Uh, keep it simple. Uh, now is not the time necessarily to do lots of new things. Uh, do things that you feel comfortable with as a teacher and uh, hopefully that your, uh, your students feel comfortable with. And again, that, that has to do with uh, just uh, kind of the crisis scenario. None of us right now are probably processing in our brains the way we usually process. Routines and schedules. Uh, I think this seems like it's going pretty well out in the world, at least from what I can see. Most people have kind of established this if you are doing some schooling online. But I would note that this is another place where there might be a check-in with some of your students, with some of your kiddos, right? What's your schedule for the day? As a matter of fact, that might be a really interesting assignment for them. Hey, make a schedule for your day. When are you going to have TV time? Uh, in my home, I ask um, my children to tell me when they're going to have their phone and for how long and why. And no, they don't like that, but <laughs> they do it. Um, collaborate. Uh, if you're like me, I, I, I usually live my life out in the world with lots of uh, people. And so it can feel really isolating as a professional. And so really creating our own networks. If you're a leader, thinking about how we are bringing our, our uh, teachers and our professionals together, sometimes that can just be to commiserate, but other times it can, it can be very helpful professionally. Um, and by the way, a reminder that our, our students and our parents at home can be really important collaborators as well. Uh, so um, uh, I have uh, one colleague who uh, they actually tell the students they can invite their parents and also their dogs and their cats 
onto uh, their Microsoft Teams meeting, which I think that's good, that's good right? Um, as we think about moving forward, there are some things that we should consider, like engaging the whole school community in decision making about what needs to happen and why. Right now, that's not really possible, but I think over time, in the same way as thinking about contingency plans for the fall, uh, one of the things I, I've asked everyone to consider is that um, according to the CDC, uh, we will likely see a second wave of the virus, probably in November or December. And if history teaches, it was actually that second wave of the Spanish flu uh, at the turn of the last century that was the most dangerous. Uh, so in our contingency planning, that does become very important. Uh, practice, model, and promote well-being. Uh, when we get there, this is a place where our expert is going to be speaking to us about that, a lot of things to say. Um, and then pause, listen, reflect, and learn, and that's for ourselves. But I added a note here, and I, I wanted to make sure if, you, if you're not really an expert at using these kinds of tools like Zoom and Microsoft Teams or whatnot, it becomes very important to call people out. Literally, instead of offering up the ability for someone to just uh, uh, kind of raise their hand, make sure that you go around and you ask everyone to contribute by name. Um, because uh, one, I can be more uh, at a distance. I can think, uh, you know, I'm not going to participate. It's a little bit easier to hide, especially if I don't have a camera on. Uh, but so you want to make sure you're asking them to uh, participate. So um, that's the article that was at the basis of today. And um, our first uh, interviewee is going to be um, Josh Knutson to help us think about mental health. And I will stop my sharing and what that means in this kind of environment. So um, Josh is a psychotherapist. He actually uh, went, uh, his uh, master's degree is from uh, the Boston University School of Medicine. And uh, Josh, as I understand it, you've actually been a, uh, uh, a practicing uh, psychotherapist as well as uh, today. You are one of the dynamic duo behind a piece of software called Rhythm, which is a way that uh, kids can check in at home, kind of check in on all their feelings. Uh, so uh, we'll welcome Josh. And by the way, before Josh starts, I just want to say hello to my super fabulous friend, Annette Gurley. Annette is the former chief academic officer at Chicago Public Schools, and uh, she'll also be telling us about the real world in her world. So welcome to both of you. Josh, buddy, how you doing? I'm good. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm a, a, a tech CEO, so I work from home anyway. Uh, nothing much has changed, although uh, my, my 10 month old, uh, my wife and I are both missing uh, the grandparents and the help that, uh, that they provide for the 10 month old. Uh, that's the main challenge we're experiencing over here, but otherwise do, doing just fine. That's awesome. And Ms. Annette, go ahead and unmute yourself. How are you doing? Where, where am I finding you today? Are you on the south side? Oh, you are muted, my friend. There you go. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm fine. I'm fine. Um, I'm home um, practicing social distancing, um, enjoying the environments around the house. Uh, but yeah, all is well. Outstanding. Well, I think, you know, I, I just wanted to say that y you are always so put together and I'm leaving and I, I, I'm forgetting the last time I saw you, but I like to say, I, I like the range of hairstyles here. If you look at Josh, cause, cause I normally do, I normally have a lot more hair here, right? So you look amazing, my friend. And I am really, really jealous that you have someone who can help your hair look so amazing. Cause I just cut all mine off and Josh, I can't wait to see you in a month. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. There's a lot more on here than, than last time you saw me. huh? <laughs> Well, Josh, if you would start us off, um, could you talk to us a little bit about from the actual kind of medical science perspective, um, what are some of the things that are happening to our kids' brains at home? They're perceiving a threat. They're seeing these things on TV. What's happening in, in, in the neurology? Yeah, that is a, a great question. And that's the stuff I, I, I definitely love to talk about. So my, my clinical degree um, is from a medical school. So I was a therapist, but um, I did a lot of studying sort of neurobiology and neurophysiology. And, and so I, that's a perfect question for me to speak to. I think, you know, the main thing to, to note if we're talking about students in particular 
uh, is that you know you have kind of three parts of your brain. Uh, you have your, your thinking part, which is kind of this frontal cortex. You have your emotion centers, which are down there, sort of the middle part. And then you have what they call like your reptilian brain. That's the kind of stuff that just runs all the automatic stuff. Uh, and when you are you know, in a normal uh, socially engaged place, uh, you're, you're feeling calm and, and ready to learn this, you know, thinking part of your brain is turned on. It's ready to pull in information, consolidate it and, and learn. Um, when you are perceiving threat, um, and, and really, you know, perceiving threat doesn't have to be this right there in the moment. Oh, uh, you know, someone's coming after me. It can be sort of a, a, a sub threshold kind of, oh, this kind of little anxiety underneath. Um, it, it, you, the, the activation in your brain shifts a little bit away from that thinking part and down into those more emotion and, and lower parts, um, which is uh, an adaptive thing, by the way. We shouldn't uh, say that this is a bad thing. This is actually a, a great thing. It's there for a reason. Um, we should be shifting to places that get us more activated and ready to defend ourselves uh, when we're, we're facing threat. Um, but I think the, the, where this becomes a challenge again is that when we have this diffuse threat, this thing that just kind of is lingering in the background, it's not like right there in front of us, our bodies still and our brains still respond as if the threat is right there ready to get us. And so it, it, not only is it not particularly healthy for us long term, but it also leaves us in a state where our, um, our thinking parts of our brain from the student perspective, the parts that we would use to consolidate information and learn, um, are, are sort of shifted off uh, uh, in a way, uh, which makes it a little bit more difficult um, during a time like this to learn and makes it particularly important to take a moment to address that piece uh, before we dive right into to trying to, uh, to learn. You know, Annette, I'm thinking about obviously in your work uh, in a lot of different places, but certainly in Chicago, we know kids that, that show up to class with those kinds of things. If you are giving advice to um, teachers or to parents out there in this environment, any advice you might give them thinking about how we might help the student to, you know, uh, relax, take care of some of that need as they're getting ready to, to learn in this new environment, which could be the threat in and of itself. Yeah, I, I think it's important that we let parents know. Um, a lot of what you said in the article spoke to, you know, letting parents know not to put the pressure on because what we've actually done is we've transferred the pressure to the parents. Now I have to work and I have to help my child get their work. So there's that, that uh, pressure that's there, or I just lost my job. I got laid off. So that's the pressure that's there as well. So what we want to be careful is that the parents don't transfer their frustration and their angst to the students. Um, I think, and this is from experience, when the workload first began to come in from uh, the kids being um, you know, released from school um, and being told to shelter in, um, what the teachers gave was more than enough. I think they were trying to give the kids enough work to keep them occupied. But because this all happened so abruptly, that wasn't the messaging that came with it. So we found ourselves feeling very overwhelmed, like, you know, the kids have to do this. And, you know, even being an educator, having the kids sit for far too long trying to work their way through things because we didn't want them to fall behind. So I think it is critical that you give the message and, and that you share with them that, it's okay if they don't finish everything, right? Um, if we can provide some type of guidelines in terms of what the schedule will be like. We talked about the importance of routine. We know that because we're, you know, we've all been classroom teachers. Parents don't know that, right? So um, mm. giving them the message or giving parents the message that, you know, relax, let your child relax, um, don't make this playtime for him or her, but don't be over um, burdening them with this. And, and you, we have to explicitly say it, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really great advice. 
You know, Josh, I was thinking about if you think about what's happening with homeschooling versus saying homeschooling in crisis, right? Because that's really a, a different kind of thing. If I'm, so I have two kids uh, here at home. One of them is homeschooled regularly. The other one goes to public school, so they are homeschooled in crisis right now. Um, any commentary for how it's different for those two kinds of events? Uh, I know that. Um, here in Palm Beach, there's actually an active homeschooling community and folks are saying, you know, hey, what do you do? But it isn't really transferable because the student is in this really different place. Any thoughts about that? How are they different? Yeah, I think there's two things that, that come to mind just off the bat. And, and um, one comes back to what Annette was talking about, which is um, the routine. Um, the other is to kind of come back to the point I was making before, but I'll talk about routine first. I mean, there is, uh, and maybe I'll bring it back to the brain, our brains like routine. And, and actually the firing in your brain, uh, um, it is, it has a routine. It has kind of a, a, like they call them like neural pathways or highways that it fires down, like grooves it kind of likes to go down. And, and so um, naturally human beings, we, we are creatures of habit and creatures of routine. And so when you're in a, you know, a typical homeschooling environment, you're in your routine. And, and, and your, your mind knows how to take, oh, okay, this is when I do this and I can shift and now my brain's ready to take in information. Um, but in this different context where you're completely out of the routine and again, to the same thing Annette said, this happened so abruptly. Uh, there was no, hey, let's transition into a new routine. Uh, it's, it's a whole different thing. And I think also with regard to that, you're, you're, those thinking parts of your brain, it, they turn on in context. So when you sit down in that chair in, in your classroom and you settle in there, your brain says, ah, this is my routine. It's time to turn on and get ready to take in information. When you're, when you're in a normal homeschooling environment, same thing, right? You, you, you wake up, you go sit down at the table and you know, this is my time. Uh, well, when you have all these different contexts around you, when you're shifting from a school learning to this sort of crisis homeschooling, Again, your brain is, it's in a different place. Like, I don't, am I supposed to be learning right now? What's happening? Uh, and so it, it makes it really challenging to take in information. And I think I, I would also, I want to mention about the parents too, the difference between a parent yes. homeschooling and a parent homeschooling in crisis. Um, to come back to what I said before about the, the different parts of, of the brain. I, I mean, that applies to parents too. When you're homeschooling in a normal context, you know, you're doing this, your mind is not in a threat place, you can do that really easily. But when you're a parent that's also worried about, uh, maybe I've, I've been laid off, what in the world is happening? Maybe I'm watching the news and I'm being inundated with, uh, I, you know, all of this, this not good stuff that I'm seeing. Uh, it's a similar thing. If you're asking, learning and teaching, they happen in the same place. And so if you're in that more threat mindset, then you're, you're not ready to sort of share information either. And I think this is where it becomes really important on the parent side uh, to, to be, and I think maybe we'll talk about this later, but to be kind to yourself, patient with yourself, and, and use your sort of awareness to notice, hey, am I, am I even in a place right now where I can teach my kids? Or, or maybe I need to take a minute uh, to, to resettle and, and get into that. So I think there's a lot of differences. Um, and I certainly think we, we should speak a little bit more about the self-care for parents, but uh, I think that's, I'll, I'll stop there and, and pass it back to you guys. So Annette, you've been actually doing it, right? You want to talk a little bit about your, your real experience right now and how you find it to be different? Sure. Um, and I want to add to something that he said when we're talking about the difference between um, homeschooling under crises. Um, he, he touched upon the adult attitudes, but when I ha am, have made a conscious decision to homeschool my child, I am the preparer of the lesson plans. I am familiar with the curriculum. I know what I'm doing. When I'm homeschooling in crisis, I may step up to the plate as a parent to own that responsibility but I don't know what to do necessarily. I'm following someone else's lesson plan. And I think that that's key as well. Um, but um, as someone who's been following someone else's lesson plan, um, it's been an interesting um, experience for me. I have uh, three great nephews 
um, and they're in grades two, three, and three. The school is departmentalized, so they have, um, each of them have a reading, a teacher who teaches reading and social science, a teacher who teaches math and science, um, there is a music teacher, there is a computer teacher, um, and there is an LD resource teacher and a PE teacher. So when they came home with their packets, they came home with the packets from all teachers. The initial package was a paper package, um, but just after that, then the work started coming online. Um, and so um, the school uses several platforms. Um, Google, I'm sorry, uh, Class Dojo is the platform that they use to communicate with parents. So we were familiar with Class Dojo. We were already familiar with Class Dojo. We were familiar with IXL, uh, Reading A to Z we were familiar with. Um, uh, those are the ones we were familiar with. But once the work started coming online, then other resources began to appear. Um, Epic uh, came into play, um, cl uh, Google Classrooms, Flipgrid, Seesaw. And so I had the pleasure of working with the students to access their um, instruction. Now, I had a particular um, or unique circumstance, I believe, because I'm working with them remotely. Typically, I'm there with them but I was working with them remotely. So I had to use Zoom to contact them. But the, ch the challenge that we had was that the family or the household was not prepared for this. Uh, there's one old uh, desktop computer that if you turn it on today, it might fire up by tomorrow. Um, and then there was, there was one iPad um, and there were two tablets and they were pretty much, they were inexpensive and they were for the kids to do their IXL and their reading A to Z, which was fine but the tablets would power down in the middle of every assignment that we were doing initially. So that was a huge challenge for us. Um, the dad who typically, you know, leaves the homework up to uh, myself and my sister, who's a retired educator, um, sat with the boys as they did their work. So that was the upside. He sat with them every day so that he could hear what they were doing. Typically, he comes in, he speaks, and he goes right past as if, you know, homework is not his, his deal. Uh, and that shares, says to me that we have to be careful in terms of putting parents in positions where they let the kids see um, perhaps sometimes what they don't know. And so that was, you know, just being conscious of that. But it was very safe because he was sitting next to them, and then I was directing them online. Uh, but the technology was definitely a challenge. There were four children in the house um, and they did not have reliable technology. So that was part of our headache. When the platforms began to change, then we had to become familiar with each of the new platforms. And as we became familiar, I watched my nephew become more proficient with navigating, you know, the Google Classroom. Well, we encountered a challenge of glitches with technology from time to time. Uh, the boys' names are very similar. Uh, and one initial is JL, the other one is JD. When we tried, so JL's teachers were much more tech savvy. So the technological work was coming from them, you know, his Google Classroom mail was coming right away. JD's teacher was learning the process, so that work was coming later. When we tried to access JD's Google mail, JL's mail kept coming up. Teachers were very responsive. They got right back to us. Um, she called me, we Zoomed, she walked me through it. We were actually able to access JD's email and guess what happened? JL's email transferred over to JD's email. So these were some oh, of the no. that we were having, um, you know, just getting on the tech, not, not even really getting to the work, but accessing. So access was a, was a challenge for me initially. Well, so, you know, when we think about self-care, Annette, what are you doing to take care of yourself in all of that? Uh, before we hear from the, the psychotherapist, uh, uh, what, what are you doing in your real life to keeping sane? So it's so interesting that you should ask that. I changed tops just before this, this um, uh, interview. Um, I hula hoop daily. And so I have a weighted hula hoop wow. and it's a senior hula hoop Ooh. class. And once the gym closed down, um, our instructor gives us Zoom is wonderful. Um, and so we have virtual class every morning and it's a great way of, mm. you don't realize the importance of connecting with other adults 
um, outside of your spouse. And uh, that's you. So I do that. And then after each session, I take a nice walk around the neighborhood. So that, that's been working for me so far. Thanks for asking. Uh, that's awesome. Well, Josh, when we think about um, different kinds of self-care, maybe things we need to look for, how to become aware, and how it's different from kids and adults, uh, give us some advice, some things to think about. Definitely. I, I have to say, Annette, hey, we need to get rhythm on, on that list of uh, platforms that you guys are using over there for your social, emotional learning and mental health. We've worked out all the kinks in our technology, too. It shouldn't be uh, no, no weird JD, JL bugs over here. Um, no, but uh, uh, as I was, as you were reading the list, I was like, oh, come on. Ah, oh, no, no. That, um, anyway, I digress. Uh, uh, Kevin, you know, I think... Uh, there, there's, uh, there's a couple things that, that I'll say about self-care. One is, I, I, when I was uh, practicing, I like to use this metaphor with my, with my clients. And, and I think one of the problems uh, with, and, and maybe in this situation, people get self-care a little bit more than they, they would typically. But I think one of the problems with self-care is that there's this kind of logical uh, um, fallacy that people have where they say, you know, I, I need to be it's not about me. It's about my kids. I need to, I need to, you know, take care of my kids right now. I don't have time for my own self. Well, you know, I, I think about, you know, I try to, this is the metaphor I like to use. So let's imagine ourselves as a, let's call it a flute, an instrument, right? And the intention that we have uh, is, is the air that gets blown through that flute. So let's say the intention is that I want to uh, continue to provide my, my kids with a quality education, even when they're not in school. Right? Well, if, uh, if that's the air I'm blowing through this flute here, well, if that flute is super dirty and clogged and all the holes are, the, the buttons are sticky and I, it's not going to play a very pretty sound. Right? It's not, it's not going to be a very nice song. And so, we might do well uh, to, even though it seems like we should just keep blowing that through that fluid as hard as we can, um, we might do well to take a moment to clean the thing up just a bit, right? To, you know, get some, get that stickiness off of there. And then we're going to play a much more beautiful sound. Right? Our, the intention that we have is going to come through us and, and actually uh, work and, and do what we want. So I think that's the, the case for self-care. Uh, and then I think the other piece that I would say sort of in the broader perspective here again is that we also have to be able to recognize when we need to take a moment for self-care and that's a that's a skill uh that's an awareness skill that that is challenging and and i think to go back to that list of, of things that that we, uh, we we talked about at the beginning you know again if my intention is to do those things that's great but if i'm in a threat place and if I'm stressed out and frazzled and I don't even I, I've totally forgotten what that list was right and so the, the the core skill that we need in a time like this I I really believe is awareness is the ability to mm -hmm. notice whoa I, I need to go take a moment to, to hula hoop in the backyard for a minute right or hey I need a walk real quick before I dive back into this uh, lesson plan that I've been been passed along, right? So there's, you know, we can, I think everyone has their own strategies for self care. And I think we could talk more specifically about some of those if we're open. But I think from that broader perspective, you have to make a commitment to to say, I, I buy that metaphor that Josh said, uh, I, I buy that I got to clean my flute before I play my song. Um, and, and, and commit to do that. And then the second thing you have to have is the awareness, uh, enough awareness and attention to notice that you need to do that for yourself uh, before you, you dive into something. Um, I, I think those are the really important pieces and then, you know, specifically how you do that self-care is, um, I'm certainly open to talking about some of those things, but I think that's kind of an individual thing. We all, we all kind of know um, what, what works for ourselves. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I see Sebastian's face. He's probably saying we're about ready to wrap up. Is that right, Sebastian? Um, I'm afraid so, so. I was thinking about, that's all right. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I would note, actually, I had a good friend uh, just this morning ask me if I was stressed. And I said, um, I don't think so. Why? 
And they said, well, you know, I've noticed in the past uh, couple of weeks, you've just been different. You've been a little bit shorter and, and things. And, and I think it really pointed out to me that, that um, I was really thankful that they asked and I needed to ask others more. And I was also really thankful for the feedback. Um, Annette, maybe if we could end with you, if I think about teachers, um, teachers right now, they, they do have this thing that they have to do. But if I'm a principal, I might feel lost. I might really wonder, what is my world like? What's my job like right now? Any advice for our senior leadership as they think about supporting principals or for principals who are in a really new setting? Hmm. Ah, that's a tough one, Kevin. So this is for principals supporting teachers in this new way. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's really important that um, they set out, be, because they are not face-to-face, -face, they can still have their virtual meetings. I think it's really important for the principals to check in on their teachers, one to see how they're doing, because it's different teaching a classroom of 28 kids in a classroom, no matter how needy they are, than when you're teaching them and your four-year-old twins are in, in the room or in the other room. Um, so I think, you know, just as we were talking earlier about you know, checking in on the students, or I think it was one of the questions that uh, you had shared with us. I think checking in on your staff. If you can have, you know, just a regular check-in meetings, but individual meetings, just like your friend looked at you and saw that you were stressed. We know our people, you know, so just maybe reaching out to them, you know, how can I help, you know, uh, what is it that I can take off your plate? Some of the same things that you would do if they were in the building with you. But just realizing that this is a this is a new world for them, especially the teachers. I'm sorry, yeah, the teachers who have young children. Mm, great. Well, listen, uh, Annette Gurley, one of my favorite, most talented human beings ever, uh, uh, caring for her own family, but also all the children of Chicago always. And Josh Knudsen, uh, uh, we'll actually send out to anyone who's here. Um, uh, some information about Rhythm. Rhythm is a uh, uh, little piece of software that allows the students to check in, check in on their feelings, and for teachers or parents to be able to see that information as well in a really easy way. I know many of us are worried about our kiddos who are at home. So thank you so much, Sebastian, Ruth, Linda Gale. Thank you for uh, making this happen, and we'll see you all on the next Chat and Chew. Thank you, everyone, for joining and for your attendance. Yeah. Thank Thanks. Bye.